Hello. So if you're struggling to understand me, um, but you will be more comfortable listening to Russian or to, um, sorry, not Russian, what have we got? Italian and um, Bahasa Indonesian, they are the two languages that um, this next talk will have a live translation for, so you can join the Mumble server for that. Um, uh, yeah, before I get to our next talk, there's also our first um, breakout session, self-organized. Um, some people call these birds of a feather because it's uh, groups of similar people flocking together. Um, so the first one that's been organized is starting now. If you're on venue list, you have to switch to breakout room one, and that's open mapping hub um, for Asia Pacific area. So um for that um you can switch a breakout room one but here in the main talk um and on the live stream of which i think about 80 people are watching the live stream at the moment um we're going to be hearing a talk by tobias about 3d rendering with osm2 world and tobias will be available for questions um so make sure you ask those um, over to the talk. Hello, and welcome to my presentation on 3D rendering with osm 2 world osm 2 world is an open source software that I've been maintaining for a few years, which creates 3D models from OpenStreetMap data. There are a lot of things you can do with 3D models, and osm 2 world tried to accommodate these use cases by having a large number of output formats. For example, it lets you export the 3D models to files in standardized formats, which are supported by a large number of gaming engines, 3D printing tools, modeling tools, and other tools in the 3D ecosystem. It lets you generate PNG images, essentially snapshots from a virtual camera, including tiled images that can then be displayed with leaflet, open layers, and similar web frameworks. And of course, it lets you generate interactive scenes that you can explore with OpenGL or WebGL. If you want to give it a try, it's available for download from osm2world.org, and documentation is available on the OpenStreetMap wiki. This image is an example of the kind of scene osm 2 world will generate from OpenStreetMap data. But of course, a lot depends on how well an area is mapped in OpenStreetMap. For built-up areas, perhaps the most common tagging model related to 3D is simple 3D buildings, which is essentially a set of tags that you can add to building areas or building part areas to describe them in further detail. This slide shows roof shapes, which can be tagged with a simple roof shape equals flat or skillion tagging. But there's a list of other tags that is part of simple 3D buildings as well, such as tags for the height, the number of levels, the material, or the color of a building or building part. There are many other features that osm 2 world supports and which are necessary to create a well-rounded 3D model of the world, which include roads and lane tagging, including sidewalks, surface details, uh, curbs, other kind of barriers or dividers, and many other features like that, and a long list of other topics that osm 2 world has 3D models for, which I've described in a bit more detail in my earlier 2018 presentation on 3D Beyond Buildings. I have also published a list of tags on the Tag Info Projects project, which allows you to give, get an overview over the kind of tags that are already supported in osm 2 world today. The rest of this presentation is divided into what I call feature spotlights. So in order to make this presentation interesting to people who already know what osm 2 world is, I focus specifically on features that were added over the past 12 months, the first of which is simple indoor tagging. 
Simple intro tagging is another tagging standard for OpenStreetMap data. And it's quite well supported by several editing and rendering tools. But osm 2 world is, I think, somewhat unique in trying to use it for 3D rendering and specifically seamless indoor and outdoor 3D models of buildings and the world as a whole. This is possible because simple intro tagging has from the beginning been designed to be compatible with simple 3D buildings. Simple intro tagging boils down to drawing areas and ways for things you need for a floor plan, such as rooms, areas, and indoor walls. But of course, any other feature can appear indoors as well by simply being within the outline of a building and carrying a level tag. Indoor rendering in OSM2 World was added as part of the Google Summer of Code 2020. And it has the goal of a seamless 3D world that combines the data extracted from simple 3D buildings and simple indoor tagging at the same time. This is a screenshot of a simple example for this kind of tagging, showing the inside of a room, but with a seamless 3D world, this allows you to look out of the building through windows, through open doors, and other connections between the inside and outside of this landscape. As the screenshot demonstrates, the basics are working, but there are still some open tagging challenges as well as simply unfinished programming tasks, which include the interaction of simple indoor tagging with building part mapping. Indoor features outside of buildings, such as commonly seen with railway stations, height differences within a level, and some details such as balconies, which don't have any appropriate tagging conventions yet. The second feature I would like to put a spotlight on is attachment connectors. If you've never heard of attachment connectors, don't be surprised because I made that term up. It's something that I came across in different contexts when working on osm 2 world often enough that I found it useful to introduce it as a common abstraction. The basic idea is that you sometimes don't just want separately mapped objects such as this wastebasket and street lamp node to be represented as separate 3D models, but instead it would be better to somehow connect these models to each other. In our example, you might find that a mapper has added a support tag to the wastebasket to express how this is attached to some other object, in this case, our street lamp. And this is something I would like to be able to support in 3D rendering. To do that, I define connectors, which are points that attach to other objects, and attachment surfaces, which are parts of the outer shell of a 3D model that other objects can attach to. And if I find a nearby surface that matches the type of the connector, I move the 3D model of the model with the connector on it, to attach to the surface appropriately. The result is a seamless 3D model representing two different features that are attached to each other in both the real world and in the 3D rendering. Note that the waste basket is no longer exactly where it was mapped. This seems sensible because I don't expect OpenStreetMap data to have centimeter level accuracy. So the information that these objects are connected to each other is likely more reliable than the information about the precise position and latitude and longitude of the wastebasket. Also note that I had to modify the wastebasket model by omitting the posts that would otherwise be rendered that connect the basket to the ground. Essentially, we had a few simple steps. We defined surfaces that objects can attach to. We defined connector points that want to attach to those surfaces. We find the closest suitable surface for each connector. 
and remove and rotate objects appropriately so that the connector and the surface are in direct contact. And as I said, the reason why I created this as a special abstraction and made up a name for it is that I found it to be a quite general and flexible approach. For example, we can attach other objects to our street lamp, but that's not very surprising. What is a bit more surprising is that it also works for seemingly different challenges, such as attaching these rooftop solar panels to the building's roof. And it worked for entirely different things as well. For example, it worked for rooftop parking. It works for attaching objects such as billboards to outdoor and indoor walls. It works for indoor floors, which is actually where I first used this concept. For example, if you have a table that's on level three of a building, you need to lift the 3D model to the correct elevation that it matches the floor level three of that particular building. And as an extension of that concept, you want to sometimes attach objects to multiple levels at the same time. For example, a flight of stairs might have two connectors, one at the top and one at the bottom. And in between those two points, it's just an interpolation of the elevation. Finally, I would also like to support it for objects and bridges, but unlike the other items on that list, that feature isn't implemented yet. It's still a work in progress, but I'm confident that it will work very similar to attaching objects to the correct indoor level. The only difference is the tagging that underlies it. You are using layer or location equals bridge or tags like that instead of the level tag. But the basic principles should be the same. The third feature I would like to focus on a bit is physically based rendering. Physically based rendering or PBR is simply speaking just a way to calculate how light interacts with 3D objects. It's one of the most popular concepts in 3D rendering at the moment, and it's called physically based because it's at least loosely inspired by the way physics of light work in the real world, although it's of course not an accurate simulation. Consequently, material properties also tend to get names that are related to physical properties, such as roughness or metalness of a material surface. PBR improves the visual appearance of objects compared to what osm 2 world used previously for its rendering pipeline. But it also improves compatibility because it's such a popular uh, concept for 3D rendering at the moment, which means that many other tools also use it and can therefore now use osm 2 world models much more easily. One notable change that was necessary to make PBR work in osm 2 world was to add additional types of textures. The basic idea of a texture is to remove complexity of 3D models by just putting an image of an object onto an otherwise smooth surface. This is something that osm 2 world has been doing for quite a while with textures representing a material's color and opacity. But osm 2 world now also supports different kinds of textures, such as normal and displacement textures, which depict the small scale elevation changes in a surface and the roughness, metalness, and occlusion information, which is commonly used in PBR pipelines. For easier handling and to remove the number of downloads with web-based applications, osm 2 world combines several of these textures, such as color and opacity, as well as occlusion, roughness, and metalness, into multi-channel textures. And with most applications, osm 2 world only outputs color, normal, and ORM textures. Displacement textures are supported, but only used with some output formats, not all of them. A different way of classifying textures is by the kind of storage. Textures are commonly stored at raster images, and when you download textures from the internet, 
such as the excellent ambient vg.com, this is what you generally get. But textures can also be represented as vector images, which I'm using a lot for traffic signs, or they can be, which I added to OSM2 World only recently, on demand when the program is running. This is an example of an image generated on demand. The actual traffic sign is a vector image, but the text on the traffic sign is a runtime generated texture that depicts the value of an OpenStreetMap tag, the name tag in this case. And it would not make sense to create this kind of image as a PNG file for every town or city in the world. Instead, it just generates it on demand in a text that uses a font that matches what is commonly found in that area on the ground. Composite textures, another example of an image generated on demand. And we can see an example on the back of this very traffic sign. I wanted to avoid having to store two textures for each traffic sign, a front texture and a back texture. So I'm just using a standard metal texture for the back of each traffic sign, but taking the alpha value, the transparency information from the front texture to make sure the sign has the same shape on the back as it has on the front. There are other examples of images that osm 2 generates on demand. Notably, it generates images on demand when that's necessary for compatibility reasons. Not all output formats support vector graphics, for example. And to make it still work, I convert the vector images to raster images during the runtime of osm 2 world and output the raster image along with the generated model. Another detail of the PBR implementation in osm 2 world is that it supports colorable materials. Like many other PBR pipelines, osm 2 world uses color that can be multiplied with a base texture. This is necessary to support common simple 3D building tagging, where material and color are often tagged as separate tags. And this yields a number of possible combinations that would not be realistically possible to represent by having textures like red plaster, green plaster, blue plaster, and so on. So instead, I'm just having a single plaster texture, multiplying the space texture with the exact color that's being tagged for that building, and having a large number of possible results as a consequence. This also allows for random variations where there's no specific color tag, but I'm instead relying on default values. Texture snapping is another way of improving the visual appearance of textured surfaces, and it's also supported in osm 2 world now. The idea is that you sometimes have a repeating pattern in a texture, such as these tiles on the wall, and if I can get them to seamlessly end exactly at the end of the wall by making the texture a little bit larger or a little bit smaller, osm 2 world now it does this during the runtime of the program. All this work on PBR has meant that osm 2 world can now easily support GLTF as an output format. GLTF is an open standard for 3D models. It has been called the JPEG of 3D, which is quite appropriate because it's supported by an impressive number of applications and it's just a very practical way of exchanging 3D models between different domains and applications. GLTF is also capable of representing a 3D model as a single file. So instead of having a large number of files containing textures and material properties scattered all over your file system, you can just have a single file that's much easier to handle, upload, download, or exchange with other users. If you are exporting 3D models from osm 2 world GLTF is a format I would recommend that you use nowadays. It works very well, for example, with Blender, which is what this screenshot shows. 
only small tweaks are needed to actually get all the PBR features to work. The rest works out of the box with Blender's Shield F importer. As a final short spotlight, I would like to say a few words about real-time performance. This has been the focus of my work on OSM2 World over the past few months. I would like to add features such as level of detail and a texture atlas and have already added features such as instancing, all of which are meant to make OSM2 World generated models run more smoothly in a real-time context. The overarching goal is to finally launch the WebGL front-end that has been in the works for quite a while, which will allow you to view OSM2 World generated models of OpenStreetMap data in your browser without having to install any additional software. I'm confident that we will be able to publish that front-end in the next few months, so stay tuned for that, and in the meantime, Thank you for watching this presentation. So um, I'll assuming you can all hear me. Um, we'll go to the questions tab. I don't think there's been any questions on um, on Twitter. But um, so Tobias, how about using the same node for street lamp and waste basket? Um, what would other OSM tools make of doing that? So in general, I find it easier to work if you follow the one feature, one OSM element principle, so that uh, these are separate nodes, because otherwise I get an issue with making sure that height or material information is interpreted correctly. It definitely stops working when you have multiple features of the same type attached to the same object. So like if you have two sets of traffic signs on the street lamp, one on each side, then you can't really map that at all as a single node. So I think um, placing a node in the approximate vicinity and using that support tag mechanism is probably better for tools, and I think it's reasonably easy to do for mappers, unlike, for example, using a relation or something, which would be even more overkill than that. Yeah, I think uh, it's open street maps getting more detailed and uh, kind of you do need to work out these ways, but tools like yours, well, uses of the data like yours and the tools will start defining uh, how we do that mapping. Um, there's a couple of questions similar. Um, uh, so OSM to world only shows Germany, Switzerland, Austria. Will you make it worldwide? I definitely plan to make it worldwide. I think it needs to be said that the map that's currently visible on maps.osm2world.org is not actively maintained anymore because, as I said at the end of the presentation, the goal is to replace it with a solution that works with WebGL. The current one uses open layers and server-side rendering of the images. So it's essentially on its way out. This means that it has, unfortunately, a lot of uh, glitches at the moment because I'm not investing any time into it anymore because, yeah, as I said, it will be replaced soon. I hope that the WebGL solution will also make it easier to support a larger part of the globe, at least, because it will move 
rendering from the server to the client, so the server has less work to do. I'm not sure if I can support the entire world at once with my single server. Um, but of course, it would be possible for other people to help out by setting up additional servers for other parts of the world. And I would definitely welcome help with uh, server administration because that's something I'm not very good at and that I don't enjoy. So if you want to help make that uh, happen, yeah, please get in touch. Right. Yeah, so I think there's in the chat there's quite a few reasons people might want to get in touch with you to help or for you to combine with projects. Um, you can use the direct message option on Venulus to do that, um, to do a direct private message. Um, but uh, also related to that, um, someone's asked, can the map on OSM to World be a toll layer on OSM? Org. Um, I'm guessing that's also related to kind of your how you're managing it and whether it's worldwide. Yeah, I mean, there are criteria for inclusion on uh, OSM.org which are not being met, which would be it would have to be worldwide, it would have to be sufficiently powerful to handle the load. So that also would require me or someone helps me to invest time into setting up a proper server for that. Yeah, so maybe if someone's got the ability to help that, it'd be good um, for them to get in touch. Um, uh, possibly this jumping around with lots of questions. Um, okay, what tools, this is a good question, what tools would you use to easily add 3D tags in OSM? Um, myself, I'm using Chosen for that. Um, it does the job quite well. Um, there are plugins that help, um, like there's a Kenzi 3D plugin that offers a bit of a preview, but of course, myself, I'm just using uh, OSM to World as a preview tool. Um, it can open .osm files that are saved by Chosen, so you can locally preview it on your machine before you upload it and yeah with that um chosen i think is totally up to the task yeah i think that's what i get at least when i'm doing more detailed building mapping is uh jawsm editors a bit better than the id you've got the kind of can click around close up and and do measuring and and different tools um cool uh so there was a um yeah okay this seems very specific but it was a question received by email um your map um osm to world has a lot of errors it's littered with black and white rectangles without content is this a general error or only on that person's computer yeah that's what i said before um i'm no longer putting effort into that map because it's on its way out so no it's not a problem with that person's computer it's just the map being on uh yeah okay so we'll um we'll look forward to that new version that um that you do and do you have a, a time period for when you think you'll have launched a new map viewer for it um i hope that it will happen within a few months so um definitely stay tuned for that Right, brilliant. Um, okay. Uh, do you know a platform um, or one that's going to be coming for sharing geo referenced 3D models? Um, there is a 3D model repository, um, which I am actually supporting. So it's a lab. Um, websites that you can upload 3D models to um, with some channel location information and you can then add a link to the 3D model as a tag to an open street map object and osm to world will then replace whatever is in OSM with that 3D model which is essentially a solution for the problem that there's a level of detail when OSM probably stops being the right uh, platform for adding that kind of data. Um, it hasn't really taken off, but I think it is 
it would be great if more people uploaded 3D models. Um, cool. Uh, so I think I might miss this part of the talk, but why is in your upcoming performance when you already define the rooftop in several models and also in other indoor objects like windows, stairs, and so on? I'm not sure I quite get that. Um, um, okay, so the general idea of level of detail is that um, yeah, I can easily generate a 3D model that has tons of detail, um, like for example having detailed roofs and all the indoor information for a building. But if you're only looking at the building from far away, then you don't actually need every chair in every room of the building. And your computer probably can't handle that much information for every building if you are just looking at an entire city from far away. So, yeah, the idea of level of detail is dynamically removing information that's too small to be relevant to the current scene. Of course, all them to world is still able to add this additional detail and will do so when it comes to showing the model close up but as a performance optimization, it omits them when they're not necessary. Yeah, so it's all about managing it. It's doing a lot there, and there's a lot of details it is shown by the sounds of it. Um, this might be a quick one. What about two traffic signs on the same side of the lamp? Can I ensure that the correct one is on top? Um, Yes, that's actually um, part of the definition for how the value of the traffic sign is structured. It essentially has a list of values that's ordered, and you can also use a, either a comma or a semicolon to separate them to tell if the traffic signs actually belong to each other or are just um, um, above each other without a semantic reason for that. Um, okay, um, go go with one more. There's some more questions coming in, but this I think is related to our, what tools to use. Um, what about street complete? Is that good for adding the 3D data? So I guess I should extend um, street complete an app that just asks you quest specific questions as you walk along. Um, would that be a good one to use? Um, it is a good tool to use if you want to add 3D information to existing elements. So if you, for example, want to add the number of levels of a building or a roof shape, then Street Complete can do that very well. Um, the point where you need a different editor is when you start subdividing the building into different parts. So, for example, if one part of the building has a different color or a different height, um, then you need an editor that can edit geometry. Yeah. So it might be good for certain areas at a certain stage of mapping. Um, but I think maybe some of this you might have to keep going back to your computer with JOSM to update other bits. Um, great. I'm going to leave it there. Um, I think there's been various discussion in the comments and some links. Um, there is the post-talk chat room um, that I think you'll go to, Tobias, and people can chat about 3D mapping in there and OSM to world. Um, we now have, that gives us our first break in the program. Um, so... Well, you can take a break. For me, that's going to, in the UK, going to involve having some lunch um, and eating some food. I think some people watching are having their breakfast now, um, or maybe you're just joining us and uh, you're going to catch up on some of the comments. Um, and if I work out the time, um, so in UTC, I'm going to get confused here. It's in an hour, hour and a half, I think. 
hour and a half. Yeah. Um, in an hour and a half, we'll have our next session of talks. Um, so enjoy your breaks, but also on Venulus, there's the global tech space chat and the Mappy Chit Chat Lounge. Um, so I'll see you there. Bye.